Coming up next on Tech News Today, we've got a new show from a new studio. The East Side Studios were all moved in. We're going to have a lot of fun today. We're talking Android 7, a.k.a. Nougat is here. You got it yet? Also, Apple's acquisition of Glimpse is going to be good for portability of health records. Uh, the Emotive is actually a device that converts your brainwaves into controls for many things, including BB-8. And a cell phone that puts itself together. Robots are worried about losing their jobs for a change. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1582, recorded Monday, August 22nd, 2016. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage process into the 21st century with a fast, easy, and completely online process. Check out Rocket Mortgage today at quickenloans.com slash TNT. And by Igloo Software. Igloo is an intranet you'll actually like. It connects people with the information they need to do their best work. Try it for free at igloosoftware.com slash twit or sign up for a live demo to see it in action. And by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you fresh, high-quality ingredients to cook delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Hello and welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show we talk about everything new in technology that happened today. <laughs> <laughs> everything that happened, period, <laughs> including everything that we're surrounded by. Yes, right we are now. in our new studio. Um, this isn't exactly, we haven't ha we haven't put everything exactly where we want it yet. We might move it. I might sit in the corner and say, no, I want that there, and I want that there, and I want mm -hmm. that there, and someone will do that for me, um, probably me. But we're almost there. I'm Megan Maroney. Did I already say that? No, we didn't, but that's okay. I'm Jason Howell, and uh, yeah, I think probably it's going to be that wall at some point that we're going to be up against the wall you can't see that one over there that you can't see <laughs> yeah, that one. just envision a wall right there and most of you are just listening to this anyway so you're like what are you even talking about <laughs> might sound a little strange right now we've got things that are in the works throughout the course of the week all the stuff from the brick house going to be moved over here dialed in things going to sound look great you won't even know anything changed mm -hmm. and if you are listening i, I just want to say everything's perfect Everything's perfect, and I'm <laughs> nothing happened again. Nothing, nothing's <laughs> different this this time around. Uh, let's get started with some news. That yeah. certainly hasn't changed. That there is news to talk about. Uh, there were rumors pointing to a release of Android Seven Nougat or Nougat today, and those rumors, at least this time, were true. Don't you love it when that works? Uh, the latest ma a major version of Android begins the process of rolling out to many supported Google Nexus devices today. Users who are already enrolled in the dev preview, the developer preview, like myself, were able to immediately update this morning. Not all Nexus devices are eligible, though. Factory images and over-the-air updates are rolling out for the Nexus 5X, the 6P, the 6, the 9, the Player, and the Pixel C. So starting to get you know the official Nougat train uh, has left the building. Uh, still no <laughs> word on the next crop of Nexus devices. That's HTC's Sailfish and Marlin. In past, the new version of Android has been kind of tied to those new devices releasing. So it's kind of a, a different year this time around. Mm -hmm. Well, Leo installed it right before iOS mm -hmm. today. It looked pretty. There was circles and <laughs> magic happening. And then he <laughs> got it and was very excited. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess... Uh, if you, what about your Samsung phone, your your Galaxy phone? Will, will that come anytime soon? Or don't know. I mean, I I think at this point we don't really know of the manufacturers, you know, what their update schedules are. We know that you know some of them are better at this than others. Yes, the Samsung Galaxy. I can pretty much say safely that yes, the Galaxy S7 line of Samsung devices will get the update. You just don't know when. You don't know if Samsung's going to be on the ball. And that, that kind of goes for all, you know, all manufacturers. And that's just a, a big source of frustration for everyone, right? Is that, okay, great, Nougat exists and it's rolling out, but there's such a small percentage of people that have Nexus devices. And everyone else, they're behind these barriers, these walls that prevent them from getting updates until the, both the carrier and the manufacturer kind of get their, their heads together and, 
and actually do the work to push it out. And that could take months, if at all, depending on what device you have. So there's some multitasking, take advantage of the big screen. I read uh, Ron Amadio's review on that and said, you know, he said it works okay. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, sometimes he was just tasking on one side and there was a screenshot of the app on the other um, there was, there's new emoji, but not all the new emoji, like the promised new emoji where, you know, the, the female emojis aren't just doing their nails. They're all right. running and doing, you know, all know, sorts of surgery. Jobs. <laughs> yeah. Jobs. I mean, underneath there, there's, there's a lot of actually really great features that it's easy to kind of not, not notice at first. One thing that's really cool is seamless automatic, uh, system updates, which, Chrome OS has a really great kind of update me methodology. You don't even know that an update has has basically downloaded and prepared itself. You just see this little icon down the bottom that says, "Oh, I you know, click to restart." And when you restart, that update is just folded in and you're not down any time. More or less, Android kind of has this baked in. So if you buy a device with Nougat um, pre-installed on it, you're going to see the benefit of that, and your updates are going to be very seamless. You got the notification improvements, things like bundled notifications all together, uh, things like uh, like power user controls over how you get notified on what, inline reply, um, battery tweaks with Doze, which you know, prior with, with Marshmallow Doze was really isolated to when you set your phone on a table and it's inactive, then it kind of ramps down how it manages uh, manages the system underneath. Now it's really, when your screen is off, it's doing a lot of those same improvements. Uh, and then of course VR baked into, into the OS, which I don't know what a big deal Daydream is going to be, but that's there. And like you said, multitasking, which is actually really cool. There's a really easy way to double tap the multitasking button and it'll switch between the two most previous apps that you've been using. So if you've, you know, got information in one app and you want to port it over to the other one, instead of having to kind of jump through hurdles, you just kind of double tap and jump right to it. I think you left out the most important part, which there's an Easter egg that <gasps> lets you give mm -hmm. treats to a virtual cat. Yeah, it takes a little bit of setting up. I played with it a little bit. So basically what it is, you have to, you know, you go through your standard. With, with Android, there's always an Easter egg. If you go into the settings and you go to the version number and then, you know, pulls up like the graphic in this case is the big N. And I think it's if you double tap it three times and then hold, then you get this little cat button down at the bottom or cat notification down at the bottom. That activates cat, kitty or cat mode or something. You have to go into your settings and actually add a quick setting in there, a little button for feeding or for putting out a dish of food for a cat. And then as you're using your phone, if you put out the right snack or the right treat for a cat, uh, eventually they, they come along and they eat the snack. And then it's like you've logged. It's almost like Pokemon. It's like you log that you got that particular cat and you can name it and it's silly, but it's there. <laughs> Virtual cats are great for us on Tech News Today because part of the requirement of uh, being a host of Tech News Today is that you are allergic to cats. That's and we both yeah. are. That's why we got this job. So yeah. we like virtual cats. Uh, yeah, virtual cats don't make me sneeze, and to, for that, I'm very thankful. <laughs> well, there is health kit, care kit, research kit, but today, Fast Company reports that Apple has acquired Glimpse. That's Glimpse with two eyes, no Y. Uh, it's a health data company that compiles all of your personal medical information into a tidy, shareable package that Glimpse claims is secure. Now, Glimpse was started by Anil Sethi. He's an Apple. He was an Apple systems engineer from back in the '80s. Uh, he has had other startups that have been purchased by WebMD and others. So, yeah, this is just Apple getting into the uh, health, getting deeper into um, the health fields. I mean, I think this is something that we really need. Um, you know, we need to be able to easily share our information, um, our health information. It, it keeps us healthier. Um, and we need to do it securely because we don't want that information just to go out. So the idea with Glimpse is that you can share it we can give people a glimpse of it. You know, you can decide who you're going to give a glimpse to your health information and for how long, mm -hmm. um, not just out there on the cloud for anyone to access it and then, you know, go all well, minority report on you with it. Right. Yeah. All about portability. And, uh, in, you know, we've made a lot of advancements with technology over the years, but it really seems like kind of healthcare documentation and stuff, it's, it gets siloed in this plate, you know, this, this doctor's office that you went to and for you to have access to that or for it to be easily accessible by other places becomes a challenge, right? Um, you were saying HealthKit, iOS 10 with HealthKit installed, that actually right there already allows you to request a medical record if your doctor has digitized them. So this seems like a perfect fit for that. It's, uh, you know, docs, photos, journal entries, all that kind of stuff. You can export all of that information into a single file 
um, and it pulls in patient information from more than 1,500 health centers, pharmacies, labs, if you've given approval as a patient for it to do that. And so it seems like a, a really great way to kind of make that information portable and usable so that when you're done at a, you know, done at a particular doctor's office or, or whatever the case may be, that information comes with you and it's not just stuck in the system somewhere, mm -hmm. which I feel is like is totally the case with me. Yeah. You know, well, I'm always starting from square one to explain my history to the next person. I mean, it's there's so much information. It used to be the doctors just had to just go from what's in their brain, maybe ask some other doctors around them, you know. But now we have so much information, and if we can just get it together in some way that uh, can be easily shareable, I mean, you know, just having just you know, I go to Kaiser and just having the record of symptoms or things I've complained about, or you know, things that my kids have complained about over, you know, just for it's been I don't know, like almost a decade. A, 10, you know, 10 years since I've had that information. It's just n nice and easy to be able to say, oh, yeah, you also complained about that, you know, in January 2006 right. or something like that. Sure. So, yeah, it's great. But it is it makes people nervous to know that it's out there. And, you know, we have a lot of laws around keeping it, pr you know, protected. And we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. The health industry isn't really excited about, you know, sharing all this stuff or, you know, they a lot of their systems are old and um, not so secure. So, yeah, this this who knows what it will become, but something. Yeah, I mean, the old system aspect is what will be a challenge for this, right? Because I mean, this only really works if the doctors have gone through the the um, the process of digitizing all that information and kind of stepping into the next phase of where they're at. And by the way, Apple did a really great job of keeping a lid on this because this happened months ago. Uh, and no one was the wiser until Fast Company kind of discovered this. Right, they haven't commented on it for sure. Yet, right, so we don't know. But yeah, that's that's sort of their way. Like they don't, um, you know, they don't really announce things like yeah. this too much. Netgear is introducing a new multi-unit router called the Orbi to help tackle the problem of weak Wi-Fi throughout the home. The company calls it a Wi-Fi system and not just a router because of the inclusion of everything you need to extend Wi-Fi along with software to make it all work. Uh, there are two units in total. One's a primary router for plugging the modem into and another that you put elsewhere in your home. Supposedly it's capable of 4,000 square feet of coverage uh, Netgear hopes that the units are attractive enough that you'll want to position them prominently throughout your home so you get the best kind of connectivity throughout. I feel like technology right now is an, as a, quote, attractive home appliance is kind of a thing, right? Echo, uh, Google Home, although it's not a product yet, you know, they've kind of tried to make that look like an air freshener. Uh, or, <laughs> you know, these are these are like tech, tech products normally are, are hidden behind this, this ugly you know, usually black or gray casing, and now they're starting to make it so that you want to show everyone. Well, I mean, that's better, right, for yeah. uh, for routers or for something that you're talking to. Like, it needs to be out in the, you know. Well, yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, that that's the thing. We hide our routers. We put them in closets. You know, we put them up on shelves, and then we don't get the access that we need. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is along the lines of Eero, which is a Twit sponsor. They sponsored mm -hmm. iOS Today. Um, Eros are a little smaller. These are bigger, but they're bo they both look nice. They, it's true. Like, it's not something I would mind, you know, having in my living room. Five hundred dollars is a lot of money. <laughs> well, I saw so I saw the two pack selling for three ninety nine. Okay, four hundred dollars, which would be four hundred dollars. But when you yeah. break it down, I mean, I think what they were saying is yes, that's a little bit more expensive. But everybody's an upgrade at this point. Everybody has some sort of solution in their home, and it's probably sub one hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and it's not working at all. Right. And so, in order to actually do this, yes, it's an increase in price, but it kind of validates itself uh, based on that. Yeah. You know, because you're not going to buy another sub nine hundred or sub sub hundred dollar device and then expect it to work any better. Right. Uh, Netgear claims that that's just not the way to go. Yeah. I <laughs> of mean, course, they want to sell these. So there you go. Right. I mean, <laughs> I, I consider myself a relatively, um, you know, technical person. And I have and I have a small house. I have twelve hundred square foot house. It's not giant. This is supposed to cover like a three thousand four thousand square foot house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Four thousand square feet. Um, but. I don't get access everywhere, and you know, with the Amazon Echo and the Echo Dot, I, I need it. I hate when it, you know, doesn't yeah. have access. Um, I got the Netgear AC twelve hundred desktop Wi Fi range extender. Um, paid eighty six dollars for it. <gasps> sub one hundred. That's what. Well, that's just. Is that but, the sub one hundred? Yeah, eighty six dollars. Yeah, I mean, that, that it doesn't work. Falls into it's, the Netgear, Netgear kind right. of uh, so, like, do philosophy I, here. Yeah, and it's it's sitting there. Like I I you know finally got a chance to set it up, but I couldn't set it up and. Um, 
and you know I couldn't return it to Amazon at that point because it was too long yeah. for and so yeah it's eighty six dollars that I burned essentially and it's just not working right and yeah and I'm sure I mean it's just like I try to get it to work and then it doesn't you know it's just like I just don't have the time to yeah. really devote to my own home network which is sad like the you know cobbler's children have no shoes situation um, but <laughs> so I don't know maybe four hundred dollars if it worked would be worth it I mean we all rely on Wi-Fi these days so much in our home and it's not just tech enthusiasts anymore that's and I think that's pro probably key of this whole category of devices is that in order to do this prior to these kind of appliance me methods of doing it you kind of had to know what you were doing and you had to know mm -hmm. the terminology and the thing to pick up to extend you know the Wi-Fi extender that goes with the router that you already have and the, and all that kind of stuff and I think at that point you know normal people's eyes just kind of glaze over my eyes glaze over I never did it because I just didn't want to go you know go through it and then realize I didn't know enough to make it effective you know and something like this it's all contained in so I think it's a good category it's just a little expensive yes well fusion reports that a 20 year old Pakistani technologist has created art directly from his brain using an $800 headset and an algorithm. The Emotive is a brain wearable that offers access to advanced brain monitoring and cognitive assessment technologies. Asad Malik used all the raw data coming from his Emotive. He translated it into visual representations using an algorithm where particular colors and patterns represent different emotions and patterns of thought. So there's, uh, if you're watching the video, you can see some of the art now. Um, that is him sleeping, I think. Uh, sleep, the yellow sleep. one, I think is described as... Uh, Sitting on our A double dollar sciences. <laughs> so that, that's what it's like. So the motive is designed to... I set you up for that one, sorry. The motive <laughs> is designed to monitor stress, allow you to track your ability to focus and quantify other brain functions. So it's kind of like a Fitbit for our noggins. Do you want one? I would love to have one. This thing is super cool. So the Epic uh, headset, uh, like you said, records brain waves, translates that into functional data. It's an EEG, sends that information wirelessly to a computer for all the analysis and everything, shows you kind of the dynamics of brain activity in real time. And because it's learning patterns of, of your brain waves, it allows, and this is outside of the art aspect. The arts, art aspect is, is pretty cool, but it allows you to do things like, they, they show an example of a guy who's wearing the headset, and on the screen, on the computer screen, is an image of a flower. And um, I can't remember exactly the, the process of the flower opening and closing, but basically, they tie, they're tie like they able to analyze his brain function to the sense to where, from that point on, he can figure out how to think about it properly and just thinking about it in that right sort of way is enough to activate the flower opening and it takes him a while i mean it's basically you know this is telepathy to a certain degree it's it's technology enabled telepathy um but i mean you're literally your brain is a control method method and that's so cool it I love is. it so there's two emotives you were yeah the epic plus is a high resolution 14 channel mobile eeg used for contextualized scientific research grade results and the emotive insight which is a prosumer five channel mobile eeg used by engaged individuals seeking better understanding of their brains and mental state so that's, that's the 300 dollar one uh -huh. um 299 so cheaper than the last thing that was going to give me a wi-fi <laughs> do you like want wi-fi in your home <laughs> yeah or do you want to, put this or do you want to control things with your brain <laughs> i mean you know for for the average the average person is it easy to justify one of these things hell no like i don't know what i'd do with it it's cool i don't know what i'd do with it well you'd have less stress so okay. that'd be good right i'm not stressed look megan i am not stressed Okay, I could probably use one of those. Um, well, you can move BB-8 with your mind. Did I? Oh, I, I didn't right. watch that video, but no, maybe. no, it's it's pretty cool. I think you have to skip about halfway through it in order to see it. But mm -hmm. yes, there is a little BB-8, um, whatever toy uh -huh. uh, that, that moves around. That you know, he's wearing the emotive, and he can kind of kind of push it along. There's all the code I think that that goes into it. But eventually, he's able to use his mind to move the BB-8. I guess we're just gonna have to trust him, though, right? Yeah, I, mean. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's true. We don't actually know. I guess. I guess. Right. See, like, could be so see, <laughs> he's been putting his hand up like a like a Jedi and making the BB-8 roll across. I believe it. Looks real to me. Yeah. Uh huh. I don't know. <laughs> I believe it based on the video that I saw prior on the on the originating article that really kind of showed 
the cool kind of concept and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, proof of concept behind this stuff. You might already know this, but the CEO of Emotive says uh, that that uh, myth that we only use 10% of our brains, uh -huh. that's not true. We use a lot more. Mm. Does he know how much I'm... She? Or is she? Does uh, she know how much? No, no. maybe she does, but yeah. more than 10%. Okay, 11% <laughs> then. I mean, right now I feel like I'm using about 3%, but I'm yeah. tired. Oh, yeah, that's true. It's, well, it's Monday. <laughs> It's like 2% Monday. <laughs> Samsung is doing a bang-up job when it comes to its approach on premium smartphones. The Galaxy S7 series, including uh, the recently released Note 7, all show that Samsung knows how to make a premium device and, more importantly, get customers to pay premium prices for them. But the company is looking to take its progress in premium and extend it to lower price points. Uh, by selling refurbished used versions of its flagships. This is uh, this is not confirmed by Samsung at this point, but uh, those in the know apparently know that Samsung is working on this. Users who sign up for the one-year upgrade programs would basically be providing the stock um, so that you know they could buy them, essentially sell those refurbished um, old and gently used devices. Uh, to people who are interested in paying a little bit less, uh, but still get a you know last year's premium model essentially yeah I, I like that idea re reuse recycle apple and i mean apple's doing this right now right like mm -hmm. they've got a program apple resale comes in around 69 percent of the original cost one year after launch in the used sales kind of market right now sam's samsung flagships generally sell for around 51 percent of the original price uh in the u.s a year after launch so definitely lower than apple Still decent, uh, you know. Still decent return there, especially if it's you know if they're just kind of getting these things as part of their uh, their program, and then they just receive these devices, do a little cleanup, um, make sure that they're good to go, and, and push them on out. So, um, so you know, a Note Seven uh, right now selling for eight sixty four new. If this were to happen, and it was the fifty one percent or whatever that Samsung's doing, that's four hundred twenty three dollars that they would be able to recoup. You know, and others wouldn't i suppose because you know they'd be able to get that for themselves so i don't know how that interferes with their mid-tier devices though that would be a challenge up next megan had a chance to chat with manush zamarodi a uh, host of the note to self podcast about a few things but before that interview let's take a minute to thank rocket mortgage by quicken loans they are the sponsor of this episode uh, I've been through the mortgage process, and though I enjoy waking up in, in our own home, kind of the fruits of all that <laughs> that labor that led up to it, uh, digging out all that stuff was just not very fun at all. And any way that you can kind of improve that process to make it easier so you can get into your home and be happy uh, sooner, faster, without any headache, uh, I'm all for it. Rocket Mortgage brings the mortgage approval process into the 21st century. It's fast powerful and completely online. Rocket Mortgage has taken all the complicated, time-consuming parts of applying for a mortgage out of the equation. So if you hate searching through stacks of old files and paperwork, well, with Rocket Mortgage, you can easily share your bank statements and pay stubs at the touch of a button. That sounds pretty easy, right? That helps you get approved in minutes for a custom mortgage solution that's been tailored to your unique financial situation. And beyond that, with Rocket Mortgage, you can do all of this on your phone or your tablet. You have exactly what you need in your pocket, basically. It's a quick online process that you can manage from the convenience of your couch. So if you're looking to refinance your mortgage or to buy a home, check out Rocket Mortgage today. All you have to do is go to quickenloans.com slash TNT. Don't forget the, the TNT at the end there. That's quickenloans.com slash TNT. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLS consumer access dot org number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. What is the secret to work-life balance for parents? Is it technology? I hope so. Uh, joining us to help maybe answer that question is Manoush Zamarodi from the Note to Self podcast. Welcome back, Manoush. Megan, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So last time we talked, uh, you had the Bored and Brilliant project, which yes. was amazing. Uh, you taught people, you went through little lessons every day of ways for people to put down their smartphones and maybe come up with amazing ideas. Uh, I did the project. You replayed it um, this this past month, I, I assume, in order to prepare for the, the project that we're going to talk about. Um, and it was funny. I listened to it again because I needed it, it again. It was a boot camp version. Like, we, you know, it's, it's hard to take a full week to do one of these interactive projects when you don't have the full week 
um, then you can do the boot camp version. I feel like we all need the boot camp version of everything these days. And so why not do that for, uh, for figuring out how to use your technology purposefully as well? So yeah. I'm glad to hear you did it. I did. I did it. Did it twice. Uh, hopefully this time it'll take. <laughs> well, let's talk about your your new project, uh, which is a four part series on Note to Self. Uh, as we're recording this, we're only in part three. Uh, you left yeah. me hanging, so I, I don't know what happens in part four. Uh, but it's called Taking the Lead, uh, and it's about two women who are trying to solve the problem that uh, so many working parents have uh, with trying to balance their work and their life and have uh, just be able to uh, do the impossible, which is have a successful, busy job and also raise children. Talk a little bit about the project. Yeah, so these are actually two moms, uh, Brooklyn moms, and I started talking to them about two years ago, and they had orig originally started as like a think tank, you know, how can we do this, how can we deal with all these smart moms that we see in the neighborhood who drop out of work, and when they want to go back, they can't get in at the same level necessarily, and they feel like they can't rise up. Is there something we can do? Well, of course, as they're thinking about all this, the app economy is, you know, happening and taking off. And so they come up with this idea for a sort of digital service, a platform um, that supports parents. Um, it went through various iterations, but the, the final version that they landed on was sort of like a task rabbit but for a trusted network. So you would be uh, hooked up with your friends and in your networks, babysitters and other support staff. Uh, and so, you know, if you, if you have to stay late at the office because a client call goes long, you have a backup, um, as opposed to a lot of people who are truly scrambling. Sure, they're on the call with the client, but they're also crazy on their phone trying to get their babysitter to stay late or see if a, if a friend can do it or, or get that other babysitter who they haven't talked to in six months. So the idea was to sort of create this network. And I really thought, Megan, oh, this will be interesting to see how work, these busy working moms become entrepreneurs, what it's like for two people who have no tech background to go to Silicon Valley, drive around Palo Alto, and really, you know, get their fingers dirty, hands dirty in this. But really, over the two years that I followed them, it also became much more of a, a deep sort of archetypal story. One of the women has a stay-at-home a uh, husband, he take, he's the lead parent, as we now call it, and she is ready to do it like the bros do it out in San Francisco. The other, though, she is the family's main caretaker, and she feels deeply ambivalent that, of course, in startup culture, you have to be 110%. And so her kid is saying to her mom, you never want to be with me. I never see you. And she's feeling completely torn. And so we really see how the tech economy is very different, difficult to reconcile with uh, some of the, the ambivalence, the dilemmas that um, professional uh, moms face. And some of the moments you capture, I think, are really universal for for those of us, it's, it's particular moms, I think, um, in this instance, because I'm talking about mom guilt, uh, you make one point where she talks about, you know, not being able to pick up her kids from school. And there's that yeah. question of, like, do we really want to pick up our kids at school or do we really feel like that's our job? Right. Like, it's our responsibility and then we feel guilty not doing it. I mean, I definitely personally went through that when I came back here, which was the full time as opposed to the freelance job I did for the decade before when my children were born. And it's like, I had to think, well, yeah, you know what? I've picked up my kids for, uh, you know, for, for until they're, they were in fifth and, uh, and seventh grade. And you know, that, I'm good. <laughs> Someone else can do right. it. Right. You're in the next chapter. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And it's interesting to me that like with so many jobs now, uh, you know, I'm on Skype with you, like technology is making it possible for us to work in very different ways, to work remotely, to work flexibly. And yet, uh, if you want to have a tech startup, there's none of that. You are all in or you're not in at all. And so it's going to be interesting, I think, uh, as we see somebody like Mark Zuckerberg take a paternity leave, how the sort of culture potentially changes as we go forward and uh, and people make more demands and dads make more demands, right? That it's not just the mom guilt. But, you know, I see my husband who, you know, he's had to work a lot this week and he misses seeing our kids. And so when it becomes sort of more culturally acceptable, the dads also have um, more flexibility at work. And it's not assumed that it's mom who's doing the pickup all the time, then maybe we can get to this sort of equilibrium. But of course, in the tech world, you know, where only I believe it's 6% of all app developers are women, 
it's it's a it's a difficult uh, nut to crack. Yeah, I mean, the episode where they do go to Silicon Valley is fascinating, and I'm a huge fan of the HBO show Silicon Valley. And it made me think that there, I mean, there are so few women characters in there already, but like, there's not a single mom in that entire show. That's funny that you say that because when Marissa Meyer was um, appointed CEO of Yahoo, I wrote an op-ed that was saying, like, oh my gosh, what an opportunity for this woman. She's pregnant to sh to set an example of how it can be done to say um, potentially. I can be a CEO, but I can also create boundaries. And actually, that's not at all what she did, right? She was like, no problem. I've got the nursery next door. I've got a total staff. I'll be out for two days, done. And 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 still here we are, and the company hasn't succeeded. So I, I almost, I had wished that she would show that there was another way to do this, um, but maybe that, you know, the culture wasn't there yet. She wouldn't have been accepted. Uh what what let's talk about need done uh, that's yeah. the app that they right. uh, that they were working on um and I, I don't want you to give any spoilers or anything, but so they, they go to this uh, app accelerator program, sort yes. of, you know, uh, I keep wanting to bring up Silicon Valley, but it's kind of like the same sort of situation, except it's in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. Of all um, places, yep. <laughs> and, and talk a little bit about what happened there, because it's really fascinating uh, how they approached uh, the, their final presentation. So it's very interesting to me that all these sort of smaller, former um, industrial cities now across the United States are taking a page out of Silicon Valley's book and starting these accelerators in the hopes of bringing more tech entrepreneurs to their, you know, really struggling economies. And so Springfield, Massachusetts has one called Valley Venture Mentors, where the idea is to incubate, mentor, and kickstart uh, entrepreneurs who will hopefully then set up their companies in Springfield, revitalize the economy. And so these two women, you know, they couldn't find anything that worked with their schedules here in New York, ironically. So they now drive up every weekend to go to Springfield, Massachusetts, three hours on the train or driving, and um, and really sort of do this boot camp um, of, of trying to learn how to become entrepreneurs. And, you know, they do what they do at every single one of these accelerator places, right? You practice your pitch. You figure out what is your valuation. What is your, um, what's the value that you're bringing to customers? How do you explain the pain point? Well, it definitely is tricky. Um, and I highly recommend that people uh, download Taking the Lead and subscribe to the Note to Solve podcast. Uh, in you, We didn't talk about your experience with Need Done, so we'll save that for people to listen. Well, before I let you go, Tell a little, tell people a little bit about what um, Note to Self is when you're not doing four part yes. series like this. Yes. Okay. So we are a podcast. We come from WNYC Studios, which is where I'm sitting right now here in New York City. It's New York Public Radio. Uh, we're a podcast. I mean, we call it a tech show, but it's really uh, a tech show about being human. So it's about how technology is changing the way we uh, work, the way that we meet uh, special people in our lives, the way that we parent, the way that we sort of really construct um, how we use our time every single day. And so we like to have personal stories and, and we like to think sort of more deeply and critically about what all this wonderful technology means for our attention spans and, and for our emotions. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, anyone can uh, find Note to Self Radio. It's noteselfradio.org or um, wherever fine podcasts are given away yes. free. <laughs> iTunes, all those things, exactly. <laughs> thank you so much, Manoush. Oh, Megan, it was such a pleasure. Thanks for having me back. Take care. So if you are watching uh, and not listening, you might notice that was our old studio. I know. <laughs> it made me forget that we moved. I <laughs> Did thought it? we were there again. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm not sitting at that table. <laughs> so I uh, interviewed Manoush about three weeks ago. She's on the East Coast. We have a lot of like tech reporters that we always try to get that um, are on the e the East Coast and also yeah. have families. Uh, and so this time when we record is usually the time they're eating dinner, homework, doing all the things uh, like she just described. So mm -hmm. whenever I have the chance, I try to get them early in the morning. And I knew that we weren't going to have our big Skype machine up yet. So that's why uh, that uh, interview is a little old. Now you can go and get all the whole series that she did over two years of research. It's great if you're interested in this topic cool. at all. So we have been reading your emails and not just the ones you've been spent sending us. I'm just kidding. We're only reading the messages you've been sending us. We have not hacked into your email yet. But after the break, we will read you some of our favorites. But first, let's take a minute to thank Igloo, the sponsor of this episode. People are using 30 different cloud services to get their work done every day. Whether you're using Salesforce, Zendesk, or Google Drive, it's harder than ever to keep track of everything. Now you can easily bring your cloud-based apps together in a modern intranet with Igloo integrations. Igloo 
is an intranet you'll actually like. It's a cloud platform that helps you share files, collaborate on documents, blog updates, coordinate calendars, and manage projects. Unlike other solutions, you can customize Igloo to fit your needs and work with your current IT investments like Office 365, Salesforce, SharePoint, Active Directory, file sharing solutions like Google Drive and Dropbox. Igloo also offers a variety of access, authentication, and identity services to ensure that only authorized users have access in private clouds over SSL and with 256-bit encryption. It's used by large enterprises and growing companies like User Testing, BDO, American Family Insurance, and ATP World Tour. You can try it free at igloosoftware.com slash twit or sign up for a live demo to see it in action. When you sign up through our link, you can get your own Igloo for up to 10 people absolutely free for as long as you want. Just go to igloosoftware.com slash T-W-I-T. So now we got some feedback. Matt Schultz wrote us in response to last week's story about Verizon wanting to sell ad space on your phone. He says, would you like to make the mobile market a better place? Of course you do. So kindly fund my Kickstarter campaign. Our goal is to pay Verizon to install our cute kitten, that's cute with a K app, our app will upon installation demand food, toys, and of course belly rubs. It will then morph into a hideous monster that takes over your phone by eating all of your free space plus taking uh, over the notifications bar with offers from AT&T, T-Mobile, and Sprint. In summary, please support the Kickstarter campaign because it will make the world a better place and maybe make Verizon blush ever so slightly in their fortress made of money. So this is a real Kickstarter campaign. No. Uh, although this doesn't sound too far fetched. Yes. Well, already, <laughs> like maybe that uh, that cat, the the kit, the I know. Kitten oh is no. An ad. This is oh, this is a harbinger of something really <laughs> bad on Android nougat. Suddenly, I'm going to get ad, ads in my notification shade, which, by the way, I hope you never see uh, in when we do the the cross platform experiment because that is no fun. Don't really. I don't even know the last time I saw that, and I've only seen it a handful of times. But it's not fun. Thankfully, they've done a lot to protect against that. But I think that's kind of the point, right? Is that like Verizon's looking for all of these different ways to make money, of course, because that's what they do. They have a business to make money. So if they can sell these, you know, these extra places on the phone that you buy from them, uh, from advertising or whatever, I mean, they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. it. It makes sense. You're just as a user, it's still fun. Alfonso responded to our request for feedback on video calling last week. He writes, I love video calling. I think that the ability to see another person adds a touch of intimacy to the conversation. However, I have to be honest, I use it mostly for out-of-country calling. My mother and I have a close relationship, and when she moved to Maracaibo, is it Maracaibo, Venezuela, uh, I had to come up with a way to communicate with her and see her now that we are so far apart. We use FaceTime, and it works wonderfully. There's no charge for the call. I get to see her and maintain communication uh, with my mother. And uh, so that's great. Thank you for writing in, Alfonso, about that, because we did put out the, the call. So, And honestly, this kind of mirrors my own experience. You know, like I, I don't use video calling to, let's say, call home to let them know I'm on my way home from work or whatever. Like that just seems like a, a pointless way to use that. But yes, absolutely. I don't have any family here. All of my family lives outside of the state for the most part. Um, so if I want to you know, see my parents and if I want my kids to see my parents on a regular basis, um, that's, that's the way you do it. And it's, I mean, it, it's awesome. Like it feels like the future, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't use it on any regular basis, but my kids do a lot like that. So how, do, how are they using it? Well, just the same way we used to sit on the phone for hours and hours and hours. It's just FaceTime hours and hours and hours. And it's dangerous yeah. because like I'm walking around in my pajamas or I'm yelling at the kids or something. And it's like all of a sudden I look, I'm like, oh, you're FaceTiming this, aren't you? Oh, it's so embarrassing. You can't get away with anything. Like, you know, I'll just be saying something and, you know, my kids friends are like hi Megan <laughs> oh, so myself, that's the myself. yeah so yeah. Uh, although it, it's I mean it's tricky with kids it really is because it's yeah. just like um yeah you don't you, you don't you don't know what's going on in there yeah um I could I could understand though like you know when you're when you're younger and your life revolves around the friends that you've made mm -hmm. and oh also school when when you have time for it um just talking to someone on the phone because, I mean, when I was a kid, that's that's what I would do. I would mm -hmm. talk to my friends on the phone. But that's not the reality now. If I had the opportunity then to 
air quotes, hang out with them like in a visual sense, which is how I prefer to hang out with my friends when mm. you know we're in the same room together, let's say, that if I had that option, I, I guess I would opt for it. It would just feel weird for me for video calls to be my default, to be my, oh, I'm I need to call that person and tell them something. So I'm going to call them with my face. Yeah. Like that's just not my go-to. Well, they I mean, kids, kids these days, they don't like to call people with their ears and yeah. mouth. Like that's just, yeah. they're like, oh, what call? What? Like I'd rather text and then if I'm going to, you totally. know, or, you know, it's like they'll play games with each other. Like, mm -hmm. you know, my boys definitely play Minecraft, you know, on a server with friends that are, you know, that's what they'll do for hours and hours. Um, and sometimes they will FaceTime friends while they're playing Minecraft, you know. Right. It's, Regular viewer Paul Smith wanted us to know about the 22 push-up challenge to honor those who serve and to raise awareness for veteran suicide prevention through education and empowerment. Now, this isn't really um, a t tech story, but except for the hashtag, I had not heard of this. I guess it's sort of like the ice bucket challenge. Mm -hmm. You should record a video of yourself doing push-ups, upload the video, add the hashtag, um, you know, the number of push-ups that you've done, and just to raise awareness of how many of our veterans we're losing every day to suicide. Um, it's crushing and sad, and so any way we can uh, get this more out in the open, have people think about it, and uh, so thank you, Paul. Yeah, it's it's the 22 push-up challenge because uh, apparently the statistic is 22 suicides per day uh, from those who've served in the military suffering from you know PTSD and, and all sorts of other conditions as a result. So um, right now they're you know they're they're shooting for I think 22 million uh, push-ups because it all revolves around the number 22. Right now they're uh, just uh, over nine million push-ups. Um, so we've got a table here. Okay. And well, it already broke one. <laughs> That's true. I don't know how I feel about doing push-ups on a table, but uh, you know, I, I could I could do twenty-two push-ups at some point. I'll do I'll do that. I'll I do could that. do four push-ups. Do that and then more. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what That's, is it? That's, I, That's the beginning. If you can do them on your knees, then I can do twelve. Okay. I can do twenty-two push-ups on my knees. Oh, okay. I think you could power okay. through it. Okay, you could All power right. through it for this cause. So. Well, if you've done it, if you want to do it, yeah, send us an email with your uh, link, or we'll we'll check uh, the hashtag as well. Yeah, there you go. Steve C asks, "Have you guys discussed just how bad that anniversary update to Windows 10 really is?" Leo mentioned it briefly on his radio show Saturday, but it's a lot worse than he thought. My PC keeps freezing all the time now. My Logitech webcam no longer works. I'm not sure what all is actually broken now because it's so hard to do anything. I'm just about to give up and switch to Linux. So um, I linked to a Therat uh, article that's about the webcam issue specifically. The webcam issue stems from uh, Windows allowing, the, the, with the new version, it basically allows more than one app to access the camera simultaneously. And previous versions, if one app had the camera, the webcam, another app couldn't get to it. Well, now it can do it uh, thanks to something called a camera frame server that it relays the video through. Server supports only uncompressed video streams. So consumer webcams that encode with compressed formats, like the Logitech C920, which we recommend here at Twib, uh, will notice frozen video as a result when it tries to do it. Uh, apparently, Microsoft's working on a patch. It might not be, uh, you know, available until September. There's a registry tweak that you can go in if you feel super confident in, in messing around with the registry to get around it for now. Uh, but that's just one issue. Uh, apparently there are others with uh, the update crashing computers and Microsoft thinks that's tied to third-party software not running properly with the updates. So, you know, um, clean boot, you can eliminate the third-party software issues with a clean boot in safe mode, but I don't know if that's a long-term fix necessarily. You could roll back to an older version of Windows or wait for them to figure out the solution. But yeah, there you go. Windows 10 Anniversary Edition, not going so hot for everybody. Um, but there, you know, there are temporary workarounds, I guess. So you got that. Mm -hmm. uh, so don't upgrade your, your Mac Pro or your uh, MacBook Pro to Windows 10. Okay, okay. I, I, I was going to, but thanks, Steve. Now I'm not going to. I'll just I'll keep running. Good, good warning. <laughs> TNT's fan of the day is Paul Gannon on Twitter, who says he's watching the last TNT from the brick house on his Apple TV. We <gasps> looked so young then. Oh, I remember those days. <laughs> the salad years, as they call it, mm -hmm. I think, like for some days. reason. Salad days. <laughs> the salad years. <laughs> That's where the well, salad the, years. Well, you know, 
in conjunction with each other, they make up years. Yeah. Sure, that works. Uh, show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup or your salad. Post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook, and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we're going to find it. Oh, we will find it. Uh, devices that build themselves. It's a crazy thought, and it's real. But first, before we talk about that, let's take a minute to thank Blue Apron. They are the sponsor of this episode. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone while supporting a more sustainable food system and, you know, setting the highest standards for ingredients, uh, building a community of home chefs, making you better at cooking. Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with fresh, high-quality ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. And they are, in fact, delicious. Each meal comes with a step-by-step, easy-to-follow recipe card and pre-portioned ingredients that can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. When you're shopping at the grocery store, uh, it's 60% more expensive than what you're going to get with Blue Apron. If you spend a lot eating out or at high-end grocery chains, you can now spend under $10 per person for healthy home-cooked meals. Customize your recipes every week based on your dietary preferences, and you can choose a delivery option that fits your needs. There's no weekly commitment, so you only get deliveries when you want them. Blue Apron delivers to 99% of the continental U.S., and Blue Apron sets the highest quality standards for their community of over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the United States. You're getting really good produce, really good food. Uh, meats, all that stuff. Seafood is sourced sustainably. Beef is raised humanely. Chickens are free range. Pork is raised naturally. And regenerative farming practices are used for produce. By shipping the exact amount required for the recipe, Blue Apron is reducing food waste. And it actually kind of simplifies the recipe that you're doing because you know exactly what to put in at what time. Whether it's Japanese ramen noodles, wild-caught Alaskan salmon, or heirloom tomatoes, Blue Apron brings you the best. Blue Apron not only supports a more sustainable food system, it supports happy and healthy families. Cooking together builds strong family bonds, and research shows the Blue Apron families cook nearly three times more often. New recipes are created every week by Blue Apron's culinary team, and they're not repeated within a year. So you've got spiced pork burgers with goat cheese and cucumber corn salad, summer vegetable and quinoa bowl uh, with fairy tale eggplants, shishito peppers and corn. There's chicken tinga tacos with summer squash and tomato salsa. I'm pretty convinced that there is at least one person at Blue Apron that is just responsible for naming these meals and making you salivate when you read them. Uh, check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twit. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron, so don't wait. Check it out for yourself. Visit blueapron.com slash twit, and we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Today. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. So Apple has the disassembling robot. He takes apart iPhones. Yawn. His name is Liam. Okay, fine. MIT just built a phone that could assemble itself. TechCrunch reports that MIT's self-assembly lab is developing materials and objects that can be programmed to self-construct. The lab, which is partly funded by DARPA, that's not scary at all, has created a true DIY cell phone designed to put its six separate parts together uh, this is amazing. The parts get shaken around in a tumbler. That's where the energy comes from. Uh, it, it's supposed to work the same way protein forms cells. So you can see that if you're watching the video. Uh, they tumble and then somewhere along the line, it takes a while, but somewhere along the line, they meet each other and they form a phone. So we, <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to, so th it's very interesting, like it's very cool what they're doing here. I'm trying to understand what it what, what does it satisfy what it, what is the purpose like why yeah. not have a robot is it does it, it cut down on cost uh, yeah cost yeah so it's like you know we don't have to buy big robots to assemble these things you don't mm -hmm. pay for that as a consumer we just send you the parts and you stir it around in a tub for five hours and then it puts itself <laughs> together exactly <laughs> very uh, cool that you could do this yes. it just, yeah and it, it makes sense like you know those um uh, centrifugal force things at the um carnival yeah like if we weren't if yeah. we weren't you know, hooked in that maybe with what would happen, we'd all like form one thing. That's true. <laughs> and we'd, we'd one giant person yeah. in the center. Yeah, exactly. And none of us would be alive because all we did is bounce around and <laughs> run into each other the so, whole time. So that's the future, really. It's not about robots or anything <laughs> like our privacy. It's just putting us all in the centrifugal force roller coaster and it's cool one. to look at. It just takes a while. Like they they showed off uh, flat pack furniture. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. Uh, I know. It's kind of like oh. what happened here in the studio. We just <laughs> put all the stuff and then it's like if we may have one set now. Yeah, we <laughs> we brought in all the set. pieces from the brick house. Yeah. And we just put them in the room and shook the room up and they're finding their place. Like this just kind of landed there. Yep, I don't know exactly. how it happened. Um, <laughs> they have so they've been doing this with other things. I'm getting dizzy just looking at the video. I'm going to look down here. Um, theoretically, they can create a textile to make self-lacing sneakers a reality. Because it's all about like creating like uh, programmable materials, materials that have a memory of what happens to them. Like I think they described it as when you cook bacon on on a pan, it curls in a certain way, and that's because there's enough like layers of fat that that it's conditioned to do that when you cook, and the, and that fat condenses or, or cooks off or whatever. The proteins in the meat condense in a certain way that it's almost conditioned to curl in that specific way. So what if you could create fat, just taking the bacon as an example, um, and condition it to curl in a different way? For example, taking a textile that's conditioned to self-lace itself uh, when you know an action is provided to it. Or flat pack furniture, you put it in water and shake it around and that energy makes it construct. They showed that off with this tiny little chair. It's like 15 centimeters. So it, but, and it took like hours to do uh, to finally find its form and, and self-construct. But it literally was shaken around and put itself together into the form of a chair. I, I'm glad that you explained <laughs> science through bacon. That helped me. <laughs> I think it helped me too, actually. It was like, I, I don't understand, but now I understand right. that I'm Every, very, very hungry. Everything can be explained through bacon. Science That's through bacon. That's we've learned. I think we have our title. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, all right, and that is it for this premiere episode at the East Side Studio. And if you're an audio listener, that means nothing to you. But just know that we'll, we're still doing the show every Monday through Friday. 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, 11 p.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv. You can leave us a short voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. And you can find the show on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today TV. You can subscribe to the show also. Even though we moved, it's the same place to subscribe, yeah. twit.tv slash TNT. And if you were already subscribed, you don't need to change your subscription at all. It will nope. still come to you even though we're in a different place. And you should come see us in our new place. Email uh, tickets at twit.tv. Come see us. We have a lot of room for a studio audience, and we love to have you here. And tweet at me. I'm at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. Thanks to the Burnett brothers for all that they did today and, and pretty much everybody else that works here at Twit because everybody's been working day and night. Oh, the lights come on in the city. And you can see them back there. Everybody's just done such a, a great job getting this studio together with, oh yeah, I mean, just on such a quick turnaround. So uh, thanks to everyone for all their hard work. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Yeah.